Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to our morning lecture or class or session. Uh, this is going to be a real surprise and treat. We worked a long time on it uh, as a group and Ross Nichols is up and he's going to be talking about the whispers of Moab. So get ready. And we'll have some Q&A afterwards, but we're going to get started. Uh, I can start as Ross did with me. Ross needs very little introduction to this group, or even the people watching on the internet. Uh, Bible scholar, researcher, teacher, activist, Zionist, you think of all the adjectives, father, uh, all kinds of uh, family things we could add. But I think what's most amazing to me, as I've shared things with Ross recently, is this Moses scroll that he's now written a book on that's become one of the major books in the field on this subject. And I have no idea what he's going to say, but he's going to give us an update and a summary, I think, of something to do with the Moses scroll. See, he didn't even tell me. He said, just wait. <laughs> so, Ross Nichols, I've waited and I've waited and I've wondered. And uh, thank you. Welcome, Ross Nichols. Thank you. All right, are you ready? The anticipation has been built. So, I'm going to invite you with me inside of a Bedouin tent in the land of Moab. Now what that means is, Whispers of Moab is a poem that I wrote. And I wanted to play an audio of Whispers of Moab because my lesson today, my talk today, is built on the words of a poem. It's an ancient poem. I just wrote it. But it's an ancient poem, whispered in the desert. But I designed it to be a certain way, and my son Seth stepped in, and he said, let me help you fix that. So you're going, this is Seth's achievement, and it is absolutely amazing. But here's the thing, it's a whisper. You're not going to pick up everything. I have to talk to you for an hour so that you have the ears to hear. But I want you to try. I want you to try to make out the words of this Bedouin poem. Are you ready to go in the tent with me? All right. This is good. Trace the bonds, ruins, a monument found of 
I know a lot of you are saying, I know a lot of people are saying, you know, I, I couldn't quite make that out. But Jeremiah talked about having ears to hear. Now I'm going to have my friends pass out the words to this song. And we're going to go through it because... The talk that I'm giving today, Whispers of Moab, is the name of a poem that sets the stage for what I want to talk about. The last stanza you heard very clearly. You see the point. I want you to see that point. But if you, as soon as these copies come out, I want to go through quickly and then I'm going to bring you through some slides to lay forth the evidence of that final stanza that you heard so clearly. Because everything in this poem speaks of Moab. Look, I'm going to tell you, I love the land of Israel. I've been many times now. But there's something about the desert that calls to my soul. This land of Moab. So I'm going to begin. In the first stanza, it's almost like a riddle. In the land of Moab, neath the desert sky, where secrets slumber, in the sands they lie. We gather round a Bedouin flame to hear ancient tales of Moab's fame. Tis near Nebo, but hidden from sight. None can find it, though seek they might. Opposite Beit Peor, a tomb concealed. In Moab's vale, Moses' grave was sealed. All kings from David, whoever did reign, the blood of Ruth flowed through their veins. In his fields he first saw her. He redeemed, they embraced. Who am I talking about? Boaz. Thus to a Moabite girl a royal dynasty traced. From Debon's ruins a monument found a voice long silenced was given sound. Inscribed with tales of Moab's fights, a testament to Mesha's might. In a cave near a roar in Arnon's heights, Bedouin found refuge from their foes one night. In the back in a niche, a bundle caught their eyes, hoping t'was gold they opened their prize. Inside t'were strips folded with care, the smell of bitumen filled the air. Of the message upon them they could read not a letter, but one Bedouin took them and his life became better. For nine, ten years they remained in his tent, till Sheik Erekat heard and to Shapira he went. 
Over a series of meetings he completed the deal he began to decipher, to read, to reveal. The real words of Moses, long hidden and lost, at last brought to light, but with a high cost. Rejected by scholars of faith, they proclaimed, by the hand of a forger, Shapira hinted, if not named, of the story told while he was alive. T'was impossible, they thought. Leather couldn't survive. And then after decades, it happened once more. Leather scrolls were discovered near the Dead Sea's shore. Written on leather, proven authentic and old and much more precious than any Bedouin gold. Our story is true, and the world needs to know they were wrong about Shapira, even Claremont Gano. Though some still doubt them and call them untrue, avoided a verdict of forgery, I must eschew. Those same strips connecting Moses Wilhelm to shame, may one day redeem that Shapira name. Two treasures from Moab, land of Abraham's kin, one broken, one lost, fragments of stone and skin. One deemed authentic, the fragments of stone, the skins were rejected till the truth be made known. So gather round close to this fire's glow and listen to a tale from long ago. The desert still sings an ancient song. Shapiro was right. His accusers wrong. Now it's my job over the next few minutes to tell this story so you're now out of the Bedouin tent but at least leave one foot in because I want you to feel the desert we're going to talk about some things. Obviously, this poem is inspired by two discoveries. If you look, you'll see the two discoveries. One is the fragments of stone. That's the Meshastella. Now this, by the way, is a photograph, uh, not a photograph, it is a sketch by the actual discoverer, uh, I took this photo when the Tylers and uh, when the Tylers and I were in London. We went to the Palestine Exploration Fund, and the discoverer was a man by the name of Frederick Klein, and he discovered he didn't discover. Actually, we're going to talk about this. He was shown. The Meshastella on the 19th of August, 1868. This is his sketch. Now, how many of you have ever seen the reconstructed Moabite Stella, or the Meshastella, the Moabite stone? You know, it's always shown it's curved at the top and it's flat at the bottom. It's because Claremont Gano reconstructed it, and he wasn't there. He didn't know what it looked like. In fact, Klein comes out against him in some of the contemporary reports and says, I'm the only person who saw it whole. So we're going to talk about this. But Frederick Klein didn't know uh, paleo. It's written in paleo Hebrew. So if you can look closely, and I'll give you a, a better photograph later, you'll notice that he just he's making to, to represent the letters on the stone. He's just drawing. It's not really shapes of the letters. But what he did was, if you look here to the outside edge, he, um, he does draw some of the, the uh, Phoenician characters, as he called them. And there's some details we'll talk about. Now, what's interesting is, is that the other side, where is the uh, remote? Because there's a pointer on it. Can you hand me that, Dave? Okay. So here we have the fragments of skin, fragments of stone, fragments of skin. The fragments of skin were discovered about the same time, actually, in the land of Moab. So we have two interesting discoveries, and both of them 
I think are important to talk about. One of Moab's treasures, the fragments of stone, were broken and the other lost. Two treasures from Moab, the poem says. Land of Abraham's kin, one broken, one lost, fragments of stone and skin. One deemed authentic, the fragments of stone, the skins were rejected till the truth be made known, and that's what we're going to do today. Anyone know who this gentleman is? His name is Sir Walter Besant. He was the secretary of the Palestine Exploration Fund from 1868 until 1885. Prolific writer. He inspired Kipling and many others. I mean, this guy is a brilliant mind. And one of the things that he said in his autobiography in 1902, he's reflecting back on about 17 years at the head of the Palestine Exploration Fund. Now, he has seen some remarkable things, but he begins his description of his time over the PEF with this statement. In the course of my work at the Palestine Exploration Society, I was connected officially with one great discovery and one great fraud. Can you guess which was which? Right? And we're going to talk about this. The reason that I really wanted to bring you into a Bedouin tent is because the Bedouin haven't been uh, recognized for the value that they have brought to the world. I love the Bedouin people. Uh, my guide in Jordan, Allah Adin, I hope I'll send him this link to, so he can hear me say nice things about him. He's a wonderful person. Some of you have met him. And he's Bedouin. And I want to give credit where credit is due. The Bedouin have been so helpful in many ways. They are the guardians of blessings. What do I mean by that? One thing I read over and over in contemporary reports is that the Bedouin would say, we don't want to give up the treasures of our land because it brings blessedness to the land. They're guardians of blessings. They are discoverers. They're involved. They run their world. Now, I want you to look at this map. This is a map from a book that I have truly fallen in love with. The scholar, Evelyn Vandersteen, Look at the title, Near Eastern Tribal Societies During the 19th Century, Economy, Society, and Politics Between Tent and Town. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that title, I said, I have to have that book, right? It sounds like a thriller that you're probably not agreeing, but it really is. But one of the things that I wanted to do was understand the tribal network because I was reading about the Adwan tribe, the Hameda the Beni Sacher, the Hajaja, these people are still there. I asked Allah Adin, I said, let's say that I could find a way to fund myself a trip to come to these lands. Could you connect me with the, the, the uh, tribal sheikh of the Hajaja? And he said, sure. I said, could you think I could spend like a month in the desert, like in the tents and all? And he said, yeah, I mean, we have to arrange it. They're going to want to know why does he want to stay with us. But I want to hear the stories. I want to drink the coffee. I want to learn from them. You know, I'm already reading books about what does it mean if you get the cup? What are you supposed to do? What if you have an important message to give the sheik? How will you respond? They're going to watch you. So I want to learn the ways of the Bedouin. This is a dream that I have. I want to go to the desert. I want to talk to them. And I want to hear, you know, they have poetry. Some of you have been on tour with me in Jordan. You know, I've quoted some of the poems. You know, the way that they woo their women. Your hair is the hair of a goat. You know? I mean, that's the, I want to learn those skill sets so that Bridget will feel appreciated. <laughs> this is... The ways of the Bedouin is what I want to really master. So we're going to talk about this. Now, one thing that's important to learn about the 19th century, which is my 
field. I love the 19th century. It's when everything began to come to light. In the 19th century, discoverers were coming from all over the world, and they were going with their Bible, as, it's, as we say, the Bible in one hand, a spade in the other, and they're going to places, and they're asking the local Arabs there, the local inhabitants of the land, right, Yaakov, they're saying, what, what do you call this place? And they would, they would pronounce it, and it would be very, very close to the biblical name because this native Semitic language is still tied to the land and the people. For, it doesn't matter, Arab, Jew, they, they're people, they're Amharites, they're the people of the land. And they told us so many things, so we've learned. So I want to know, but I want you to know that it was a conflict between the waning powerful world authority of the Ottomans and they, they were trying to enforce what we call the Tanzimat reforms that caused very interesting results. Discovery and destruction. This is a very important part of our story. So we're going to talk quickly about the Meshastela, the Moabite stone. I already told you it was discovered on the 19th of August. It was actually not discovered then, but uh, Klein was on a just a journey into Transjordan. He was visiting the biblical sites, and by the way, there are many, many biblical sites on the, the eastern side of the Jordan that most people never see. But he's going, and he goes to the Gilead. He reads his Bible, and this, this Bedouin guide is showing him around, and the Bedouin guide says, I have something I would like to show you no Western eye has ever seen. It's a monument. It's at Dibon. So he shows him this wonderful basalt monument face up, exposed at the tail of ancient Dibon. And Klein can't read it, but you know, his, his guide tells him this is so important, it's ancient. What does it say? Oh, you know, it says some things, I don't know. No one could read it. So Klein recognizes it must be important, and he takes down everything he can so that when he goes back to Jerusalem, he can talk to those people who are experts in ancient language, and he knows it's, it, looks, it looks to be very important. One thing he does is he has his helpers flip it over to see if there's writing on the other side. There's not. It's smooth on the back, but it's totally complete. The only thing is that the top three lines, he counts. There are 34 lines of text. He, he, he knows that the first three lines are a little bit worn from the weather, from the age. Now, the question that I had was, when the Bedouins show it to him, it's actually already been discovered. So he didn't discover it. He's shown it by his Bedouin guide. Miriam Harry is a daughter of Moses Shapira. She writes under this uh, pseudonym, a pen name, if you will. And she writes this in her book, The Little Daughter of Jerusalem. I want, you, I want to propose to you that I think I might know a person who may have been involved in the actual discovery. Nobody knows this. You ready? Shapira's daughter wrote, and I'm quoting part of this, uh, overjoyed to have the opportunity, we're talking about Claremont Gano here, was overjoyed to have, I mean, uh, Salim al Kari was overjoyed to have the opportunity of revenging himself on his former master, uh, who had guided the French consul into the Bedouins' country and had actually helped him, Claremont Gano, to secure a certain monolith which Mr. Shapira himself had unearthed. Now, People might argue that, and they say, well, we have no other source. Well, we don't have another source yet, but I promise you, I am looking. Because what I think she's saying is she heard around the house as the story breaks, Claremont Gano involves himself in this story, and he actually leads to, I believe, the destruction of one of the greatest discoveries of all time because of his greed and because of his behavior and his desire to defeat all others on behalf of his homeland. Now, he's not alone. It's a race. It's an international race. 
the Prussians through Klein were the ones who really had the first stake. The English were very noble, I would say. They withheld. They didn't jump in. They knew that there were negotiations. The streets of Jerusalem, the, the stones began to cry out about a great discovery that had taken place. But everyone held back except Claremont Gano. He pushes forward. He employs Salim Al-Khari. They work together, and I can almost imagine in the Shapira home, as word reaches that someone else is being credited with this, I can imagine Moses Shapira saying, it's the Claremont Gano. He comes back. He says he's, you see, this is the way, and that's why his daughter remembered it. So it's destroyed. One of the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time. The Bedouin realize it's, it's a year of debate. And one of the problems is, is that the Westerners didn't understand the tribal societies. So they, they, they buy, they try to buy, and ultimately they do buy. They pay the money expected, which has changed several times, for this great discovery but then when they get ready to go from one tribe to the next, the other tribe's like, you can't pass through my land. Yeah, but I made a deal. You made a deal with the Hajaja. You didn't make a deal with the Waiti. You didn't make it. You see, so there are all these things they didn't understand. So the Westerners decide, you know what? We're going to get the Ottomans involved. So they involved the Pasha, this governor, and ultimately that turns out to be the final straw. Because you know who the Bedouin hate worse than anyone? The Ottomans. So the Ottomans said, give those people that stone. They paid for it. And the Bedouin are like, who are you? This is our treasure. We're guardians of the blessing. We're not going to give you this. And the Ottomans had already begun to put extreme pressure on the Bedouin. You know they described the Bedouin as? The problem. You know, they're looking for the Bedouin solution, if you get my drift. They want to subjugate the Bedouin. They want to tax the Bedouin. They want to employ them and bring them under the Ottoman authority to serve in the military. And the Bedouin are saying, we're men of the desert. We fight when we want, with whom we want, and it's not you. So the Bedouin put pressure. Claremont Gano involves himself, Salim El Kari. If you've read my book, you know this character. Uh, but I'm not as against Salim El Kari. He, he actually um, gets a squeeze. And a squeeze is where you take, it's almost like paper mache. You, you push it into an inscription, wet, and, and you push, push, push. And it goes into the letter forms. You allow it to dry, and then you peel it off. Well, thankfully, Salim al Kari dispatched into Jordan, into Transjordan, into the ancient land of Moab, gets a squeeze of about seven lines of this text. And, and that's how we know what some of this says. Now, I want you to look at this. This is from Ginsburg's book. You see this area here, this circle, and this large section here? When you look at the Moabite stone or the Meshastella, that's all, there are a few smaller pieces, but that's all that's original there. The rest of it is reconstructed. The rest of it is plaster. It's, it's not even the ancient authentic stone. You're like, well, how do we know what letters to put on it? Claremont got no. And how does Claremont got no? No. He had a squeeze from Salim al Kari, and the British worked with him. So everybody begins to contribute. Look, I got a squeeze of a certain small piece. I got, I have this, I have this. And they began to reconstruct. So this is the result of that. Now notice how Ginsburg has the round shape on the bottom too. So when I was researching for the Moses scroll, and, and I dig deep when I do these kind of things, uh, I found I knew Ginsburg had written a book. Others had written a book as well. But Ginsburg wrote a book and published it shortly after the discovery, and it's a fantastic book. I could tell based on what I read. And I found one on eBay for like eight bucks. So I thought, well, this is, you know, I'm sure it's a reprint. I'm going to show it to you later. It's dated, it's a second edition, but it's 1871. It's literally falling to pieces, but it's beautiful. 
and, uh, and I have it here. Now, we're, we're not going to go into a lot of detail on the letter forms and the words of the Stella, but I will say this. What they knew when, when Klein got back to Jerusalem and he goes to those who know, who can read these ancient languages, they recognize a singular significance in that it is, uh, typically they'll refer to it as Phoenician characters or uh, paleo. Uh, and they begin to look at it. And if you know any Hebrew, uh, if you know uh, paleo in particular, you can look, and I'm going to pull this closer to my face, uh, Anochi Mesha Ben Chemoshgad uh, Melek uh, Moav uh, Diboni. So it's, and forgive me, Yaakov, that's about as close. Is it, okay, good, thank you. So it, it says uh, Anochi, but it's spelled without, like we would expect to see a Yud on it, it's spelled defective, meaning. This is before they used these vowel letters. So Anochi, I am Mesha, uh, the son of Chemosh God. This is he's saying, I'm Mesha, the king of um, the king of Moab, son of Chemosh God. That's his father, uh, the Dibonite, the one from Dibon. And then you go through, and th- and so this is. This is a remarkable thing. Now, why would, why would this be so remarkable? Well, one reason it's remarkable is because it's a biblical story discovered in the earth. And now, what this Stella tells us, this is uh, Mesha. We know Mesha from the Bible. He's in 2 Kings chapter 3. It's a fabulous story. And what happens is, is that... Uh, a, Let's look at that for just a moment, because I would feel badly if I didn't uh, do some biblical while, while we're here. Second Kings, uh, chapter 3. Second Kings, chapter 3. And, and I'm going to tell you the biblical story. Look at verse 4. Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep master. I, I like the way the Hebrew Bible just puts him in his place. Like a, he's a shepherd, right? Watch this. And delivered to the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs. He's paying tribute. And a hundred thousand rams with the wool. But it came to pass when Ahav was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And King Jehoram went out of Shomron on the same day and mustered all Israel. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me? against Moab to battle, and he said, I'll go up. I uh, am as thou art. My people is thy people. My horse is your horses. And he said, which way will we go up? And he said, the way through the wilderness of Edom. And the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom. Now let me just uh, go through a little bit of the story in high speed. So what happens is, he's rebelled. The king when Achab dies, Yehoram, they, there's this problem. They said, look, Moab isn't paying tribute because he thought that when the king died during the political disarray, he could get away with, I'm not doing this thing anymore, but he forgets. He doesn't realize how quickly Israel is paying attention to the political scene. So they muster the troops, and they decide to go south into this battle. So you have the king of Israel, the king of Judah. They team up with the Edomites, and their plan is to come up around. They're going to come up around the southern end of the Dead Sea and attack the land of Moab. That's their plan. It's a good plan, actually. Uh, But if you read the story, there is this concern because they're thirsty. They think we're going to die of thirst. And so they pray, and Jehoshaphat, and they're talking. There's a thing to call. We need to call a prophet. Is there a prophet and guess who the prophet they call? Elisha. We have Elisha here, right? We, there's Elisha gets involved. And the only reason he gets involved is because he, he thinks a little bit highly of Jehoshaphat. If it was just for the king of Israel, he wouldn't even go. So they go into the land, quick story, and, and one thing leads to another. The, the Moabites decide to attack. Uh, there is this battle. And when Elisha tells them, you're going to be successful in the battle, you're going to win, this is going to go your way, everything is going to go fine, 
it looks like everything is going well with the battle, but look at the last line. I want you to go to um, verse 27. Uh, 26, and when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too hard for him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of the dome, but they could not. Then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. What happened? We th I thought that Elisha said the Israelites were going to be victorious, and it looked like they were going to be, but then it's weird. It's a strange ending. That's the end. What happened? Well, then we discovered the Mesha stone, and on the Mesha stone, it tells a story about the battle, and you know what it says? Mesha says, I won. Well, that doesn't disagree with the biblical account. Great wrath came upon Israel? What does that even mean? It almost sounds like the Hebrew Bible is saying, in the end, things turned bad and we left. Well, that agrees with what the Mesha stone said. Now, the Mesha stone is dedicated to Chamosh, the god of the Moabites. We find that throughout the biblical account. But this was one of the most important discoveries uh, that, that tied the Bible to archaeology. This map, the Mesha Stella was discovered here at Dibon. And look at Aurora, just slightly east of Dibon. And look at this canyon here. It's called the Wadi Mujid, the river Arnon. There's another great discovery that takes place. So these places are real close. Like we just came back from an expedition. You know, several of us were over there. And we went to Aurora, we went to Dibon, and we kind of mapped this out, and we met Bedouin, and they were hesitant to talk to us because we were asking them, hey, we're looking for a cave. It, there's a cave, and it's this far. And you know what the initial thing the Bedouin shepherds told us was, oh, there's no caves here. So thanks for coming. I hope you enjoy your stay. <laughs> we said, no, 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 but there are a lot of caves because we can see them from the road. And they're like, no, no. no. You know any cave? Don't know any cave. Never heard of a cave. <laughs> well, ultimately, Aladdin told these shepherds, look, these people aren't interested in your treasure. They're here to tell a story. And ultimately, we met a couple of really interesting people who did show us some caves, uh, and we did get to explore some. Patty's the bravest. She's the one that goes in all the smaller caves. We use the bigger I like to be able to stand up in my caves. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this discovery. The discovery of the strips in July of 1878, Moses Wilhelm Shapira is an antiquarian and a bookseller uh, in the old city of Jerusalem, and a Bedouin and an entourage of Bedouins come to visit him, and they tell him a story uh, about a discovery that took place east of the Jordan at the Wadi Mujib. And they describe the cave, and Shapira knows this cave. And he's interested because they said, look, yeah, maybe you're interested in this. We, it, we, we heard a story about a scroll that was discovered. It's written on leather. It's ancient letters, and maybe you can read it. And uh, it, I don't know. It's, you know, it's wrapped in linen, and it's got like an asphalt on it or so. We don't know. Shapira said, yeah, I'd like to see that. Can I, can I have it? Can I see it? Well, I don't know. You know, blessings are in. We don't want to lose the blessing. So he said, I really want to hear about this. I want to see it. Let me see it. And so an arrangement, a meeting was arranged. And the next day, Shapira's not at his shop, but uh, an Arab shows up at his shop with a piece of uh, this scroll that he was told about the day before. And on it are ancient Hebrew letters. Now, Shapira sees this right away. Now, when he gets back to the shop, he said, hey, what, what did, and the guy that was running the shop for him said, hey, just to let you know, some Arab came in and he sold, he brought this and he wanted a few dollars for it, so I paid for it. I hope you're okay. He's like, okay, well, what was the guy's name? Did he leave his card? Did he, 
You know, is there anything anywhere? No, don't know. So Shapira goes back to Sheik Arakat, and he says, tell me more about this. I need to see the rest of this. Because he's already looking at it. He thinks this is important. So over a period of four weeks, several successive meetings near the Apostles Fountain on the road to Jericho, um, he meets with this mysterious person, another Selim. And he acquires 16 leather strips. I wanted this drawing. It's in my book. There were five single strips. You, you can look uh, and you can see it if you have the book. There were two sets of two. Now, these, are, these represent columns of text. So total, you have 42 columns of text. Some are singular pieces, which have broken apart. Some are two, three, four, and five. You see what I'm saying? All right, so Shapira begins to decipher this message. Now, I'm looking here. What you see is a photograph showing uh, a scan. The piece that's standing out is a purple. We call it the purple pages. I didn't discover this. Uh, Idan Dershowitz found this in a collection, a catalog, if you will, of Shapira's discoveries. By the way, Don Dershowitz is the author we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But within this randomly scattered throughout this book in Shapira's hand, he done found three pages. He's reading through this quickly, and you know what they are? They're actually Moses Wilhelm Shapira's transcription of the scroll. Not all of the scroll, but the first several fragments worth. All right? Now, Shapira is working. The reason I show this in this order, because they weren't discovered until just recently, is that this is, we believe, the early. We know that Shapira, from his own writing, said he made transcriptions of the Shapira scroll three times. This one indicates that it was an early version of the, uh, of the account. So... Um, he sends a letter. He makes a transcription. He sends it to a professor in Germany by the name of Schlotman. And when he looks at it, he and another German scholar, these are fundamentalists. They're brilliant scholars, but they're very much believers, like the authority of the Bible. And here you, Shapira, claim to have found a document that you're attributing to Moses. It doesn't match my original Ten Commandments? How dare you? How dare you suggest that our Bible is not the authentic? You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Shapira. And you know what he was? He was ashamed. He thought, he, because he, he loved the Bible. He would never want to admit that the Bible that everyone believed in was not the original, but he thought it just it felt so real. It, you know, I feel like I know Shapiro. I think he felt like when he read this, it had an, a, an air of authenticity, like it was truly ancient, like perhaps it was from the hand of Moses. But he, he thought, maybe Schlotman's right. Maybe I should put this away. So he put it in a bank, in the Bergheim Bank, and it stayed there for five years. But he wasn't just standing idle. That was in 1878 when it was discovered. You know, when it was brought to his attention, he puts it away. In 1880, a remarkable discovery takes place. I won't go into a lot of detail, other than to say a young Jewish boy by the name of Jacob Eliyahu discovered, by accident, uh, the Siloam inscription. And guess who one of the first people to go into that tunnel to work on that inscription. Guess who it was? Shapira. Shapira and his sidekick, Salim al Kari. No one knew this before we discovered it and I published it, but Salim al Kari and Shapira are in there with a candle. And, and other scholars, Archibald Sacy, uh, Claude Condor, you know, everybody who's anybody of the day is in that tunnel looking at this. But Shapira was the first, please understand this, of all the great scholars of noble blood who looked at this, Shapira said, you know what this is saying? 
this is describing the building of this tunnel from both ends. And you know what everybody knows now? What he, what he saw in it. But he also said, listen, I read line 5 not as a 1,000 cubits, but as 1,200 cubits, 200 and 1,000. And, 1, and you know what all the scholars did? I'm, I'm telling you that I'm not being exaggerative here. The scholars said, Shapira, go back to selling your trinkets in the shop. Won't you let the big boys deal with these ancient inscriptions? He said, I'm just telling you, it says 1,200 cubits. And, and, and they said, but it's not customary in the Hebrew Bible to have the little number first. We would expect it to say 1,200. So you're seeing things that aren't there. But guess what everyone knows now? Shapira was right. They were, he's right. He's the first, and he's right. But one of the people that he meets is a man by the name of Herman Goethe. Goethe is a brilliant young scholar who went to uh, Jerusalem uh, by the, you know, he's sent there by the German Palestine Association, and he meets with him, and they become friends. At about the same time, Shapiro reads a book by a guy by the name of Bleak. Bleak wrote a book uh, published in 1860. Shapiro read it a little bit before Easter of 1883. And he says, what a change came over my mind. Remember, he's already locked the scroll away. But Bleak had an interesting story to tell in his book. It's an introduction to the Old Testament. This is an English translation because I'm not fluent yet in German, uh, but I read it carefully, and what Shapira took away was he began to question who wrote Deuteronomy. He became convinced that our present Deuteronomy, in its present state, was not written by Moses or even in his time. I know people get nervous when I say this, but dead people don't write. This was something that the scholars were beginning to notice. You know, and a lot of people say, well, of course, everyone knows that someone else wrote about Moses' death and burial. Come on. But if you ask a fundamentalist, they say, no, he wrote it all. The rabbis say he wrote that part through his tears. But it also says, these are the words which Moses spoke on the other side of the Jordan. That's written from the perspective of someone on the side of the Jordan opposite where Moses spoke these words. It's not a contemporary writer. You see where he's going. So he began to get a little bolder, and he said, you know what? I think this thing might be real because it, had, it didn't match this Bible, but that's okay. Let me look at it again. He pulls it out of the bank around uh, Easter of 1883, and he begins to talk to people. One of the people he talks to is a brilliant professor of ancient languages, Paul Schroeder, and I think uh, Tabor's probably the expert in the room on that. Uh, but people begin to tell him, hey, man, I think you got something here. So he decides to take it to Europe. He writes a letter to Hermann Strock, who is a brilliant Hebraist of the time. And on 9 May 1883, he writes a letter talking about a curious manuscript with interesting variations. He describes the letter forms contained in this manuscript. He says, look, the ink, he knows manuscripts. Shapira is uh, one of the great discoverers. He needs credit for this. Many of the most valuable manuscripts, Karite manuscripts, more than 145 in, in museums today are there because of Moses Wilhelm Shapira. He knows manuscripts. And he said the ink is almost indestructible, he said. Like you can't, it's, it's very good ink. So he tells him, the reason I'm only coming forward now, dear brilliant professor friend of mine, is that I was told I should be ashamed by Schlotman and I put it away. I'm coming to Berlin. Now he missed the reply letter. The letter coming from Berlin was, don't bother bringing that nasty forgery this way. But Shapiro doesn't care. He's a man on a mission. He goes to Berlin and, of course, 
Strock tells him, you know, my eyes are bothering me. I can't really look at it. I don't have time. I'm busy with all my scholarly work for your stuff. And, you know, my eyes are kind of bothering me. So he says, okay. I hope you're, you know, he told him, I'm sorry about hearing that your father died. I'm so sorry. Because he loves people. I mean, Shapiro's a good guy. So then he goes to Leipzig and he meets with two people. This is Edward Meyer. This is Hermann Goethe. I worked hard to find these photographs that are about the age they were. They're young guys. They're you know, in their late 20s, 30s, but they're brilliant. So he goes to Leipzig, and he goes to a place. First of all, Shapiro goes to his friend Hermann Goethe. He tells Hermann Goethe, they know each other from working together on the Siloam inscription. He said, hey, you're not going to believe this. Herman, look at this. And he looks and he says, what is, where did you get that? And he tells him, look, let's go to my hotel room. I'm staying at the Hotel Hoffa. And Guta immediately picks up. They go to the Hotel Hoffa and he's blown away. Guta says, this, this looks, why are they, I've never seen anything in paleo and leather. It's only on inscriptions. How, I don't, and Shapiro says, I don't know. I don't know. What's this sticky stuff? I don't know. I don't know. Well, look, it has interpunks between the words, it, just like on stone inscriptions. Shapiro's like, I know. And Guta says, it, it, doesn't have, it doesn't have vowel letters. It's written in, in an archaic form. There are no nikudot. There's no, I, I don't know. I'm just saying, Herman, I think this is the real deal. I think it's ancient. I don't know how old it is. is does it go back to Moses? I, you never know, but God, it's... So he goes, well, look, i got to get Meyer involved. So he gets a hold of Meyer, and Meyer starts laughing. He's like, wait a minute, Shapira brought a... You're telling me this is a leather... Moses wrote this thing? I don't know. I don't know. But he, he, you got to come see. So he, said, he laughs. He says, yeah, I'll be there. We have letters we know this happened because we have their individual reports. So he comes, because he's going to disprove, he's going to tell Shapira, relax, this isn't real. But what he does instead, he becomes convinced after a very short time. He's like, you're right, this is a real deal. i got to get Airman. So he sends a telegraph to another guy by the name of Adolf Airman. All these guys turned out to be the most brilliant scholars of the 19th century. Airman says, I'll be there Tuesday to cool Shapira off. These are German scholars. He's like, I'll be there, I'll cool off Shapira. Yeah, sure, I'm coming. I'm coming, my friend. Sure enough, Tuesday he shows up. He walks in within seconds. He goes into a rap, what, what do you call it, a rhapsody. He's like, he's just blown away he said, if these are fake, I'll eat them. So these three scholars at the Hotel Hoffa, by the way, you want to know the address? It's no longer there, but it's, it's uh, I'll give you the English translation. It's at Ross Street and Ross Place. <laughs> Tell me there's not a joke there somewhere. So they meet for a week of July, 1883, they, they know that they have to convince the old scholars, the old guard, who already don't really trust that Shapir is totally clean because they think he was involved in a other, another forgery, right? Germany's been burnt once. But they, they convince a guy by the name of Lepsius. Have you ever heard the, the, uh, the phrase, uh, the Book of the Dead, Egyptian Book of the Dead? Lepsius is the guy that coined that phrase. They convince Lepsius. He becomes convinced. I hadn't published this yet, but we found this letter where Lepsius says that he believed it was authentic. But they have to convince these other scholars. And there's a meeting on the 10th of July, 1883. They already had their mind made up. In less than an hour and a half, they, they decided it was a forgery. Shapira, I'm not sure he even heard their verdict. They said, we'll give you some money for it. It's not much. So he leaves. He takes his scroll. He goes to London. This is our only photograph of uh, my friend Moses Wilhelm Shapira. 
He goes to the headquarters of the PEF where he meets Walter Besant. And um, in the meeting with Walter Besant, he tells him, I think I have the oldest biblical manuscript ever. You can read the details in my book. But ultimately, there's a meeting between Besant and Condor and Shapira, and they invite all of uh, the top scholars of the day, and it is decided in a meeting in July, late July 1883, that Ginsburg is going to make an assessment. The British Museum uh, will buy this if it's authentic. So over a period of the month of August, in three installments, the text of this scroll are published, a transcription and translation. No one says anything initially about it being a fake. The world is sitting on the edge of its seat. The bottom line is they trust that Ginsburg, the brilliant Hebraist, will ultimately help us to decide whether this is treasure or trash. Was it written in 1800 or 1800 BCE? You see, it's kind of that thing. Uh, 800 B.C., not 1800. That would be the book of Abraham or something. So ultimately, but they had two strips for public, public viewing, and the prime minister even went to see it. This is actually a page from the Athenaeum. Uh, I have copies of all these. I worked through it painstakingly to read the Hebrew here. This is a drawing of fragment E. This fragment, it's a drawing. We don't have photographs uh, with the text. But this contains the Shema and the ten words, which read differently than uh, the Hebrew Bible. We'll talk about that during the break. Shema, Israel, Elohim, Eloheinu, Elohim Echad. You notice something different about that? But there were some criticisms. Here's one, Archibald Sacy, a brilliant guy. They say he knew about 20 languages. He's like Yaakov Walker. He said this, though. It's really, it really is demanding too much of rest, Western credulity to ask us to believe that in a damp climate like that of Palestine, any sheepskins could have lasted 3,000 years, either above the ground or under the ground, even though they may be abundantly salted with the asphalt from the veil of Sedim itself, with his nose in the air. Now remember, Shapira's already kind of outsmarted him on the Siloam inscription, so he's already kind of, you know, got a little bone to pick with him. A couple other reasons they thought it was inauthentic. One is the Moabitica scandal. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but not during this lesson. Uh, Shapiro was accused of being a forger, so you like, yeah, a forger once, a forger always. A few other things. Prior to this document, no Paleo-Hebrew had ever been discovered on leather. They, they thought there's just leather couldn't survive for thousands of years. You just heard that. The use of inner punks in an, un, an otherwise continuous script. They'd never seen this in leather. Sure, on lapidary, on inscriptions, you have word dividers, but not not on leather, and it varied from the biblical text that we have from medieval copies. You hear me say medieval copies. It differed, so it can't be right. And if leather could survive, could linen survive? And, and what's this sticky stuff? One edge, by the way, of this scroll is cut cleaner than the other. It's clearly been cut from another scroll and made to look old. It's really not. And the orthography, the spelling was a little bit threw them off. Like you're, it sound, it feels like someone wants this to be ancient, so they just simply remove the vowel letters like we would expect based on what we have from Mesha. Monsieur Claremont Gano arrived on the 15th of August. He is dispatched by the French the, pub, the French Minister of uh, Public Education or Public Instruction sends Claremont Gano, the celebrated scholar, and he is brilliant. You know, I don't like him, but he's brilliant. Let's give him credit. But he's coming and he says, I, I had my suspicions before I ever saw it, but I wanted to see for myself. 
So he goes and he sees Shapira and Ginsburg working on the scroll together, and he asks him, he said, can I look? Now, neither one of these guys like him. I mean, Shapira really doesn't like him, but Ginsburg doesn't like him either. He's arrogant, he's pompous. All these guys are pretty young, you know, these scholars. But Shapira and Ginsburg were engaged in looking at the manuscript, and they let him look quickly, like he could take a quick look, but we're busy right now. We might let you see it later in the week, but not sure that we'll be able to do that yet. So he leaves, and um, he's forced. Now, you have to understand, he is very elitist. He has to go with the common folk out in the British Library and look in a cabinet dimly lit with people who wouldn't know an olive from a bet. He's standing there, and some mom's like, look, Sammy, this is what they're reading about in the paper the other morning. And, you know, the little kids are wiping their hands on the glass. And Claremont Gunn is like, I wish these people would get out of the way. So a real, but he's mad. So on the 18th, just a couple of days later, he puts his theory together. He's proven it's a fake. He's got it figured out. Here's a drawing of what he came up with. He says, basically, Shapira deals in scrolls. Obviously, he just took a scroll, cut the margin off the bottom. He had to find, you know, he, he just cut this off. One of his, he's got many scrolls. We know he's a scroll merchant, and he made this. And, you know, that theory has stuck to this day. And, you know, recently, a book by Hanan Tigay, wonderful writer. You need to read his book. But he says this. This is his theory. I think he, he ultimately comes up with the same thing. Um, oh. Another element that plays in, I think, is a little bit of racism. You can notice from this picture published in, uh, uh, I mean, look at it. So Sh Shapira's got this big hook nose, right? It's, it's going to be this typical anti-Semitic uh, stereotype, you know, hateful stuff. And Ginsburg, look how clean, little button nose, Ginsburg. Wait, wait till you hear this. So little button nose, Ginsburg. He's got Shapira, the hook nose Jew from Jerusalem. His finger is still dripping with ink because he made this scroll. But you know what's interesting? Ginsburg is also Jewish, European Jewish from the same basic area. But see, they like Ginsburg, but Shapira is a Palestinian Jew. There's this stereotype. So when, interestingly enough, Ginsburg quickly, now he hadn't said a word about being true or false, but when Claremont Gano's paper comes out, we have a letter where Ginsburg is written by his boss, and it said, you know, people are talking. I'm expecting that you'll come up with an answer pretty soon. We're looking for your decision on this scroll. And Claremont Gano, by the way, as you know, has said that it's fake, and the whole world now is lined up with that. But, you know, I'm going to the country for the weekend. With my family, I would appreciate it if you could get me your... And Ginsburg said, listen, it's fake. It was written by a Polish Jew, probably Polish... I don't know why I'm saying Polish Jew, but probably a Polish Jew because there are some words that are spelled wrongly, and I would expect that someone from Polish descent would mispronounce these letters. And, uh, and it looks like to me maybe it was cut from the bottom of the scroll. Where the hell do you think he came up with that? Well, maybe the Times of London, like two days prior. Now, there's an argument as to who came up with it first. Some people have proposed that perhaps Ginsburg told Claremont Gano in that brief meeting, well, you know, we maybe he, he, we think it's forgery. You know, it's a debate. I don't know. But before long, it's, it's come out. Everyone turns against Shapira. Shapira writes this note. It's typically thought to be like he's given up all hope. But listen to it. Dear Dr. Ginsburg, you see, I'm saying it a little bit angry. You have made a fool of me. You have made a fool of me. Um, by publishing and by publishing and exhibiting things that you believe them to be false. I do not think I will be able to survive this shame, although I'm yet not convinced that the manuscript is a forgery unless Monsieur Gano did it. 
That's interesting. I will leave London in a day or two for Berlin. Yours truly, M.W. Shapiro. And he starts to take, give it, and he said, wait a minute. Oh, by the way, Ginsburg. And he puts a Hebrew note in the upper corner because he's suggesting even now, you know, I, I thought it said such and such. Because, see, they work together on the transcription. He's talking about one word that everyone says is misspelled. He says, I think I know what it says now, and I think he's right. We'll talk about it on the break. So he goes away. He ends up going to the Netherlands. But, you know, nobody really knew why he went to the Netherlands. But I found out that in the Netherlands, it just so happened that there was like a world's fair going on there. A million some odd people went to the Netherlands at that time. That exact time. And one of the other things that was going on there is a Semitic conference. The annual conference for Semitic scholars was held in the Netherlands. So why is Shapira there? He's there to sell the scroll. He's there to meet with other scholars. He even writes a letter from Amsterdam when he first gets there, and he said, please, get someone other than these guys to look at this scroll. Let's get other scholars. Uh, and he leaves his strips of leather there, and he goes to, he's coming back. He's selling scrolls. He's still doing business. It's not like the English have said, we'll never buy another scroll. They're like, he's the scroll man. He's constantly coming up with the best manuscripts. We're going to keep buying them. So anyway, so he goes to the Netherlands. He goes to, I believe, this World's Fair event. He meets with other scholars. And guess who's there? Claremont Garneau, Ginsburg, all the big players are there. But he's, this is like a bar seminar today. And all the scholars, James was telling me when I was telling him that I found this, he's like, yeah, you can't, how, if you had a biblical archaeology meeting the year this happened, it's all people would be talking about on the breaks. What do you think about that, sh that scroll? Oh, I think it was fake. I think it was. But Shapiro was found dead in a hotel. Now people say, they always describe it this way, in a dank, dirty, scummy hotel. You know that hotel had just been built? It's brand new. It's not lit. They want you to, they, they create this false image that he's down on, he's downtrodden. He walks through the red light district. He's drunk. Shirt is everything is disheveled. And he kills himself in a hotel room. That's not the model that I see. He's staying in a brand new hotel. I have a, I found when it was dedicated, when it was opened, like the year before. The whole affair lasted about a year. From Easter until he's found dead in a hotel room in Rotterdam. Just like just like the biblical Moses. Tradition says he dies in a dar. So Shapira dies in a dark. That just like his namesake. The Torah reading, uh, interestingly enough, the weekend he dies is Kitisa. Kitisa, one thing is interesting, is a second set of Ten Commandments. Ironically, Shapira's manuscript had a second set of Ten Commandments. For a long time, no one knew where his sepulcher was. I think we now know. Everything was thought to be over until a new discovery. Bedouin discovered scrolls in a cave near the Dead Sea in the winter of 46-47. Thirteen of those manuscripts ultimately were written in Paleo-Hebrew script with interpunks. Only 13. And the only ones with interpunks, meaning dots, word dividers, are those that are written in Paleo. If it's written in other script, there are no interpunks. If it's Paleo, it has, and guess what? Only The only thing recorded, and this is from Emmanuel Tobe, the only thing recorded in Paleo-Hebrew 
or works attributed to Moses. Some scholars called for a reassessment based on the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. By the way, when the scrolls were discovered, people, you know what they said immediately? They're, they were looking for someone to help them read them, and the first three scholars they went to said, I, 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 I ain't touching that. I remember Shapiro. It's 80 years. Not me, Hoss. Find another scholar. I'm not looking at it. To this day, not to this day, uh, but for a while there were people who were saying they were fake too until you found thousands of manuscript pieces, right? And they've been carbon dated, by the way. So Jacob Teicher, Menachem Mansur, John Mark Allegro, one of my heroes. I'm sorry if you don't like him. You just haven't learned enough about him. Uh, Helen Jefferson, Shlomo Gill, Yoram Sabo. These are guys who had written on it. There are other brilliant people with this subject. So in... When I heard the story, I worked with uh, James and the Tylers primarily, Jono Vandor, you know, we started really discussing this. Uh, my book came out, it covers the whole story in detail. I'm sure most of you probably have it. If you don't, take a copy. Uh, read the story because I only had enough time to just touch on this. But this is a fascinating story and I thought, oh, if I could just bring a real scholar, you know, I, I'm saying, like, really, like a reputable scholar in this field, who a Hebrew Bible scholar who would look at it again and then maybe bring some light to this, because I was convinced, but who's going to believe? I mean, really. So wh where did you go to school, Ross? You know, I mean, this is the way the world is, honestly. So I needed a real Hebrew scholar. And then two weeks later to the day, this is published, and James calls me out of breath. Ross, did you see? Did you, did you look? Oh my God, you got to see this. New York Times. What if they were real? And I, I'm excited because I think my book is on the New York Times. It's, no, it's not your book, it's another book. What do you mean, another book? Another book about Shapira? Yes, yeah, saying the scrolls are real. It's a scholar. He's a Harvard fellow. He's a young guy. He's brilliant. He Don Dershowitz. He teaches at Potsdam University in Germany. He just published a book. It's called The Valediction of Moses, a proto-biblical book. And he, he says the same things you do, but better. Meaning, you know, that <laughs> no, but he, he says academically, he gives the philological, the linguistic profile. And you know what he says? He says, I can tell you one thing, this scroll dates to about 957 BCE. It's older than anything you've ever seen. And the scholarly world erupts. Amazing. Here's some of the things he said. None of the original reasons for dismissing the fragments are valid. None. It's a bona fide ancient documents consistent with First Temple era text. The purple pages and the linguistic profile were the things that were different. My book had 220 pages. His book had 220 pages, plus or minus. Hey, if the Jews can do it for the uh, ninth of Av, I can do it, right? You know, one or two here. Uh, we'll explain that on the break. The, but the idea is that they both told the story of Shapira the scroll. They both contained the Hebrew text of the document. They both contained a translation. What are the chances? Two weeks apart? The search is on. I'm winding down. Working with a team of researchers, many of that team are in this room. In fact, you're all on the team in a way. You're on the inside of the team anyway. Uh, we're working with researchers in Australia, in Germany, England, in the U.S., and we're following clues. We've been to England already. We're going back. We've been to Germany already. We're going back. Uh, been to a place called Burton-on-Trent because that was the last place it was seen. You ever lose your keys and you go, where, where did I see them last? Well, that's the last place it was seen. Interestingly enough, it was seen last that we know of, the 8th of March, 1889, five years after the death of Shapira, to the day. Interesting. So we're trying to validate the points 
from the story, and it involves travel to Jordan, to Israel, to Germany, to England. That's one final point in terms of what I'm working on is called the Moabitica scandal because there's one piece. Uh, Idan says none of the original reasons for calling it a forgery are valid, and I agree with that, but the only thing holding over Shapira's head at this moment is they say, well, look, even if the scroll this or that, you know, Shapira's a dirty guy. I mean, he, he was involved in that Moabitica scandal. Well, guess what? What if I told you that I believe that not all those Moabitica were fake? What if I told you that Shapira said, I think some of these are fake? Don't spend your money. You need your experts to look. If you, if you get your experts to look and you authenticate them, then you can buy them. But I don't want your money until you... And they said, no, 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 we want to buy them. He said, please. I think some of them are fake. Well, I think I know where that turning point is. So we're going to be looking into this in great detail. Uh, we went to England and we, uh, to Germany, and we ultimately got a hand inscription, a book that's the inscriptions of all the Moabitica that Shapira had. Idan told us about this, and we went and found it, and now we have it. So I'll be working on that. I estimate, you know, give me grace, but I estimate by the spring of 2025 with Don Walls, Don Walls is here. He, he had to come all the way here to hear this date. So Don and, and Carol have been very instrumental in this whole thing. And uh, because of them, we already have two books that have come out on the subject of Shapiro. They're both on the back table if you don't already have them. Uh, one is the Moses Scroll. And... Uh, Don knows this story as good as I do, at least. So if you have questions and I'm busy, just go to Don. They, they've read the book more than anybody, Don and Carol have. Um, the other book, just quickly, is called Fragments of a Leather Manuscript. When I began the research, I kept seeing references to a German work published by Hermann Goethe in 1883. It's the only academic assessment done by some scholar who actually saw the scroll. Uh, but I didn't know German, so I asked uh, Dave, said, what can we do to help in, you know, in any way? And I said, can you guys help me with this translation? And, and Dave and Patty's group has a linguistics component to it, and they hired, uh, they sent me, they uh, used one of their people, a German expert, and we worked together. I did the Hebrew, he did the German and we published fragments of a leather manuscript. Only a couple of copies there, but you can get it on Amazon. So this is the story. I want to thank uh, some people, Seth Nichols, for his work for making his Abba look good at the beginning. Uh, not only his Abba on earth, but his Abba on heaven, right? Uh, all of you for lending me your time because I do think that your time is valuable and our time is holy. It's the first thing called holy in the Bible, right? So really, I truly appreciate your attention. I know I probably went long. The officers and board of United Israel World Union who give me so much flexibility and support me in every way. Uh, yep. And all of you, the, the supporters of our work, friends of UIWU, you see I have Don and Carol on here. Uh, very specially, I wanted to thank them because it's, you know, it's one thing to have an editor who's good. That's one thing. But if you have an editor who's good, who knows the Bible, it makes it easier to work with. Like a few times Don would call me and he would say, did you mean this? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. It, it's helpful because, you know, somebody can do grammar, but they don't know Bible. That doesn't help me a whole lot at all. Uh, and Daniel Wright I wanted to mention uh, because Daniel is always ready to respond if I need cool graphics or help or maps. I can be in Jordan in the desert. I can buzz him in the middle of the night and say, Daniel, I need a close-up, a satellite shot of this, and he'll send it one. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll be around all afternoon.
thing about Ross, uh, one thing that's really clear to me, I think he's the expert about what's happening in public ownership here. Edan Dershowitz is the expert on the tax, yes. But what Ross has done, we call in the business, our business, the theory of constraints. We put all these constraints around the problem, and the solution set is very small. And we believe that this is a real benefit. That's all I have to and, say. And I, I, I would add just one final thing. Um, there are plenty of other experts in the world. Joram Sabo, I mentioned. Matthew Hamilton is hands down the man on the planet who knows everything about this. In fact, he's a good friend. He's part of our work. Thankfully, he's, he's the whole group works together. So just so you know, uh, it's not like anybody on the team really is holding back. You know, so anyway, Matthew Hamilton is incredible. I'm looking forward to the next thing he might do. All right. Okay, Seth. Hold your seat one second.